This July 2024 meeting of the Parks and Advisory Board meeting to order. For the roll call. Aaron Angel. Here. Scott Conlin. Here. Thomas Davis. Here. Paige Lewis. Here. Sam Libby. Here. Nick Novello is not here. And Council is and Sharon McClay. Present. Thank you. Uh, approval agenda. Any additions from the board or staff? Approve. I move to approve. Second. Thank you. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Last month's minutes. Any comments on the minutes or corrections? Hearing none, I'll move to approve. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. All right, next is public invited to be heard. Any public here to speak to the all staff? Okay. Over here, okay. We, we felt like we needed out number. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's very effective. <laughs> Whatever you're about to drop will be very oh, right. uh, substantial. Um, and we'll start with our old business. Item A is an update on Greenway Phase 13. So, um, I'm just here to sort of give you an overview of St. Green Greenway Phase 13 because, um, well, we can share the alignment. We, don't, we haven't had it on our website because we've had some acquisition issues with right away um, with this parcel. So, we went to council last two weeks ago on Tuesday and requested authorization to use the city's power of eminent domain. Um, to acquire that 0.94 acre trail easement because we've been coordinating with that landowner for almost two years, a year and a half. We sent them a couple offers to purchase the trail easement, but they've refused to sell us just the easement. They want to sell us the entire parcel. And it's a little over five acres. Um, and we looked into, you know, using city funds to purchase the entire parcel, but we couldn't use it for trail purposes. Like we looked at maybe a parking lot, but it wouldn't really help alleviate any of the parking issues at Sandstone Ranch. Um, and it's across the street from, this is St. Brain State Park, and they have paid parking, so we didn't want to uh, kind of conflict with that. Um, and also just being right on 119, it was a practical um, use of our funds. And we did talk to other city departments, but there's really no need for that parcel. So we did receive authorization to move forward with eminent domain as uh, an option, like a, a last resort. So we are working with special counsel to provide a final offer. Maybe we'll provide one more offer and then the final offer. Um, and that final offer, we needed the city's authorization to use eminent domain to actually provide that. So we're hoping, you know, they'll come around, but it's been over almost two years of them saying, no, we will only purchase, we will only sell you the entire parcel. Um, they recently put the parcel up for sale about, I think in March, April or May, we noticed it. So, um, and they're asking about a little over three, almost three and a half million for the entire parcel. And we offered, our initial offer was 467,000 for the 0.94 acre easement. So we will, Work with special counsel to determine a value to be our final offer. But yeah, so here's the alignment though, too, because we're going to check in with special counsel on Wednesday to make sure it's okay to put this on the public.
public facing website because that's our intent. Um, but yeah, and it goes from Sandstone Ranch all the way. This is um, so it's all city owned property, and then you get here, and this is a privately owned property, but we have the city holds a conservation easement over it. So we've been working with that property owner to acquire the necessary easements. Um, and then it goes over city owned land. There's a bridge here to avoid. Um, it's an easement that we had to avoid. Uh, sorry, Daniel, do you remember the American Power? Yeah, easement. So we can't have the trail on that property. So there's a bridge there, and then it hugs this property line, and they've agreed to donate the easements, that property owner. And then it goes across um, this parcel up to the north. And then it will be a concrete culvert under 119. And then it'll go east. And there's a bridge over the St. Brain Creek. And then it'll connect to the trail system in St. Brain State Park. So yeah, so I'm just here to give you kind of an overview of you know those recent happenings and see if there are any questions I can answer about just the trail in general or the project in any way. Yes. Yeah, for those of you who are on the field trip, Kate was just asking, we were at that corner where five turns by the American Tower. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we were kind of standing there looking over the landfill area, but then because they built all these, we couldn't see over here. I didn't want to show you this, but you got the sense of how it feels to be up above all of the, mm -hmm. I mean, this is our Boulder Creek Estates, our first open space that we ever purchased. So, yeah, this trail avoid like. <coughs> Um, fragmenting that habitat, staying out of the, the floodway. Can I ask about that? Just the 11 along the edge of that parcel, why can't it be just inside the city owned parcel? It's a barely steep slopes there. Okay, so, so it's not close to the edge there, it just can't be up there. Yeah, and, and that's really like we've argued, you know, it's unbuildable that portion of the land too. Um, but yeah, it's, and we need to, for FEMA purposes, we can't put fill in the floodway, in the floodplain. Um, it's also CDOT wouldn't allow that, and this is a partially grant-funded project um, through that CDOT administers, so we have to follow all of their rules and regulations. Um, so also in negotiations, too, we're using a CDOT-approved negotiator, or acquisitions agent, they call it. So they have to do all the discussions on our behalf with the landowner, so we're involved, but it does separate us a bit from the negotiations. There's all the great points to put on the website. Yeah. People are like, why is there a domain? Those are great reasons why you have to do it, but yeah. make sure it's covered. Maybe. Okay. Well, and just so you know, the only email I received uh, from this was from Ruby Bowman in regards to uh, her comment saying that somehow way back in the day, we agreed not to ever use eminent domain, and I don't think that's true. Uh, I think uh, maybe that was, we agreed that that would be absolutely the last resort. And and so uh, trying to complete this is really important to, to uh, not only Longmont, I think, but uh, also to the state. So uh, I think it's uh, one of those things where uh, we should use our money appropriately and not buy a $3 million parcel of land that uh, we don't really have a use for it. I would also say there's a, a distinction between using open space funds for eminent domain, and so that's something that we're being mindful of on this project. And so that was the only email I received negatively about the discussion, the concept of use of eminent domain. And I did talk to some folks about the um, proximity to the eagle roost area is a nest, and again, as we went out there in Everlast site and went this map, we have pushed this as far away, and I think there's some concern that why there was more public involvement, but we worked with, you know, Danielle can add all the other other sites, I think that are CP, CPW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the flood management portion of the state's CDOT group, so we've, we've really worked with whatever we could, and if you look at that, there's really no way we could push it any further away from those roosts. <laughs> Um, but again, I think all those people are out there. I think it's a great opportunity for people to learn about those things from that higher level. You're back, you're away, but I think the ability to to see that um, is a really important piece. But um, Danielle and her team really did a great job of taking a lot of information and threading the needle as best they can. A question uh, with the underpass. Is um, there was talk about having to have permanent pumps at one time? 
I believe, yeah, there still is, will be one. And who's maintaining them? Who's the that would be the city. The city. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't, I didn't hear you do that. Oh, sorry. You have a squeaky chair. Too. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then that, there's a tie back to fuck, whatever that is, five and a half. Yeah, it's more is. like a sidewalk connection there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then the, the rest, the rest of the path is similar to what one nineteen is, way over by Walmart thing. Um, so, I mean, in terms of width and you know. Yeah, I believe it's like. ten feet in concrete on the north side. So <laughs> the green um, indicates crusher fines, and then the turquoise is when we'll be doing concrete. Okay, are we putting any trees in? The complaint over on the other side is that it's hot as have to try to ride. No, that hasn't been part of the project. Well, one of the things with trees out in these areas is really they, again, trees are not native along these areas at all. No, yeah. way we get them to even start is by having irrigation. If you think about the amount of irrigation, with you know, maybe it pumps from the. <laughs> but yeah, it really, it really is, you know, it's a significant um, cost to try to get water out to get those trees out in, in those areas. And also, this is looking back at our St. Brain master plan, that divided the entire St. Brain greenway going through the city all the way from west to east into sections. The rural reach, the preserve reach, the urban reach. This is the preserve reach, so this is the reach where as much as we can, we're trying to make the, the trail blend into the landscape. So Crusher finds the concrete areas of the trail are because we're putting in bridges or we're going to have major erosion problems like on the drop off to Boulder Creek Estates there behind the storage unit. So we have to have concrete there. But other than that, we're, we're, we're not planting trees. We're not planting, you know, horticultural flowers. We're, you know, this is the preserve reach. So as much as possible, match the landscape with fencing. Uh, make it as natural as possible. And were there a line of question? <clears throat> did, we, did you look at all of uh, using uh, Cutting Yard 5 there as a line of uh, behind the storage facility? Yeah, they did look at that, and the the there's not much. Let me see. Um, there's not, basically, there's not much room there for the shoulder. Like, it would have been a really tight squeeze anyway. And then it does go up quite a bit in grade, so it would have been really difficult to even fit the trail in and keep it ADA compliant. Um, and then, you know, they were looking at coming through here, but this was already developed by the time we got through to to the design phase far enough. So it, that ended up not being an option, but yeah. And then, you know, there, it's been suggested like go along 119, but we're really trying to balance like user experience and safety. Um, yeah. And I don't even know that CDOT would have allowed that within the, you know, that, that plan. I mean, really looking at safety with the trucks that come in and out of there and just the traffic in general and the driveways, just not wanting that to be the trail experience for yeah. I mean, families that's a, and commuters. Storage. It's not really. Because that's like a storage area too, so you've got mm -hmm. a lot of truck traffic all through here too. Yeah. Um, on the north side of the trail, it's going to be a fence or something because like I can see otherwise people will create a social path cutting across those empty lots um, to get to the, just say two breweries living there. So there are some, there's some fencing, but really it's to keep them off this portion of the property. There's not a fence on that side. There is a fence, like a concrete wall over here because it's the training center. Right. Um, so we do have that over there. There's a privacy fence over here. There's a drop down to those businesses. Too. Like if you think about the back of Collision Brewing, yeah. if you've ever looked back there, it's it's like a big wall. They like grade it in to make their parking lot. So the trail's kind of like up above. So yeah. well, that's interesting. Well, yes, and, and part of this back in the day is looking at are we going to go along the back of those businesses and be on that business HOA property instead of where the line is showing now on the private there, the Hayes private? Yeah. Um, be just a little north of that. Can we be at the back of all of those businesses? Um, and so we had meetings and conversations with that um, business HOA and talked to them about their concern, you know, and just the fact that with this trail come um, more ranger presence. So th those are the types of conversations that we had with the business HOA. Okay. 
It will always work. I mean, if things develop and we see things that may be needed in the future, we'll definitely be continuing to work with the neighbors out there too. Last uh, question was, um, does that affect the schedule at all, the need to go through this process? Yeah, it's so where, delayed does that change where we're going to construction. Um, so the CDOT grant, there was a design phase that we used the funding, and now we have $1.25 of a grant that we need to use by June 30th, 2025. And so that also means we need to match that amount, so $2.5 million of the construction needs to be completed by then. Um, so it has delayed things, but this is a, an expensive project, so... We still think we're on track to be able to, to meet that deadline. Um, but yeah, it's it's put us significantly behind schedule in terms of timing. Do you need to wait for the whole thing to be kind of agreed to before we can start parts of it? Um, there is, CDOT offers a, a right-of-way conditional clearance. So we need to get their like clearance to proceed to go to construction bid. But first, we have to at least show where we are. So they, they would like all the right-of-way acquisitions complete. But there is an option to do this conditional clearance. So if we, basically they said we need to have all first offers out and the response, we need to know, yeah, if we're going to need to go to eminent domain for that property. And then the parcel that's going to, the property owners that are donating, we need to have their property donation form done. So we're really close with all of that, but those are the key points. And then we can have like initial discussions, but that's when we can really know if they'll, they'll let us go that route. Other questions? Thank you for that. Great. Okay, next to new business community engagement, connecting Walmart communities to the outdoors. Welcome back. Thank you. So, this is mostly going to be an update on all that grant stuff that I've told you guys about several times now. Um, but now we're sort of in the middle of the season, so things look a little bit different. All right. Oh, boy. Where is this look? Oh, the mouse. Or the seagull. From this screen to that screen. Oh, is it on your? It's on my screen. Yeah. Just drag it to the right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Drag it over. Okay. We forgot to have the PowerPoint. My mouse doesn't show up on the screen at all. Oh. <laughs> it's a little cheating. Um, can you do that? Here, I have the mouse on this one. Yeah. <laughs> I think you gotta move, move the mouse all the way to the right. I think it's off the right. Off the TV. Is the mouse good active? Oh, no, so she will be working because she's plugged in, right? This, this is her mouse. Right. That's my mouse, but it wasn't me. She did that. Okay, so I'll just grab it and then I'm going to Does that work? Just close up here. Hey! I don't know what you did, but thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay, cool. Um. Longmont Nature Kids. So this is, again, I'm Taylor, I'm the volunteer and education program person. Um, so Longmont Nature Kids is, we're just start, sort of starting it, and this is the project that's going to continue until about 2031-ish. Um, this is what we're planning for things to sort of look like, um, now that we're somewhat underway. So this will be 15 plus collaborators providing a range of opportunities. Um, so that's including you know, parks and natural resources, recreation, um, community and neighborhood resources, um, the youth center and children, youth and families, and then some like external organizations as well. Um, CSU, CSU Extension, Thor Nature Experience, Wildlands Restoration Volunteers, Calwood. Um, we have a whole bunch of collaborators involved. Um, what we're thinking this will probably look like um, once we 
So right now we're in the survey phase, we're in the community assessment phase, which I'll get to in a few slides, um, and I'll show you exactly what that looks like. But the overall view of this is that eventually this will turn into summer programming um, for youth and families, including summer camps, family programming, um, stewardship activities, um, outdoor learning, that kind of stuff, as well as in-school programs, so field trips and in-class programs, potentially. Um, and then for older kids, career pathways, so potential for paid internships, youth leadership opportunities, youth core. Um, and then some community-led programming kind of in partnership with the city. So that could be parent leadership group, groups, youth advisory boards, um, kind of finding different ways to connect the community to what we're doing in kind of an ongoing, sustainable way. So that we're not just checking in with folks once, putting a bunch of programming together, and then hoping that works forever. Um, so those are some of the organizations and agencies I mentioned before. Um, and this is funded currently by the Nature Everywhere grant, which we got awarded a little under a year ago. And that funding lasts for 2024 and through 2020, most of 2025. Um, we have 40,000 for 2024, and I'll get into what we're using that for, but most of it right now is community assessment. Um, 2025, we'll get another, between probably 50 and 100K. And this is not just for the city, this is for all of these collaborators to, to share and use as a group. Um, so we know kind of what this is going to look like because it's been done before. Um, the city of Lafayette did it. Um, I think last time I was here, maybe two times ago, I went over kind of in detail what that looked like. Just a quick slide to remind you. Um, so Lafayette had 20 plus collaborating organizations. They were looking at about a million in programming um, per year funded by GoCo, which is similar to what we anticipate. Um, they had 1,500 unique participants annually, and about 80% of that was low-income and students of color, and we're looking to do something similar here. Um, theirs, similar to ours, is a, will be a five-year, or theirs was a five-year, $10 million collective impact project, again, funded by GoCo. That's what we're aiming for here. We haven't applied yet, but we're in conversation with GoCo, and they've all but guaranteed that if we apply, they plan, they plan to fund this for us. Um, so yeah, the goal was to connect underserved youth in Lafayette to nature and the outdoor activities. Same here. Um, and yeah, it's designed for, or we'll be designing it for pre-K to high school. So really the full range, all ages for youth and families. Um, younger kids will be focused more on like backyard, just getting outside and getting comfortable outside. Um, later elementary school, middle school, um, more education, stewardship, that kind of thing, and then once you get into high school, more of those leadership opportunities in the outdoors. Um, and Lafayette did capital construction projects um, to ensure all Lafayette youth live within a safe 10 minute walk of the nature space. We're pretty darn close to that anyways in Longmont, so I, I don't anticipate that we're gonna be doing much capital construction, if any, here, but um, if we learn that there's a need for something like that, that's something that we can throw into our application with GoCo um, and try to get funding for. Um, this is just an overview. I'm not really the right person to tell the story of the Latino community in Longmont, um, but I want to give you kind of an idea um, of why it's so important that we focus on some of these lesser served communities in Longmont, um, other than the fact that we just want to serve everyone equitably here. Um, early 1900s, economic growth uh, relied really heavily on agriculture in Longmont, and that really, the work was done by the Hispanic community, which who migrated here from mostly within the US, but some also from Mexico. Um, but folks came from New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, um, and worked in the sugar beet fields here in Longmont. Um, historically, the Hispanic neighborhoods were north and east Longmont, kind of on the edges of town. Um, those neighborhoods are no longer necessarily on the edges of town, but they're still in many cases um, majority Hispanic, not all of them, but many of them. Um, and in many or even most cases, they tend to be our sort of lower income um, neighborhoods with higher economic vulnerability. Um, 
Did uh, Tatiana present at the last meeting? On her oh, it's a couple of them. Okay, cool. So you've seen some of the mapping that she's done, um, and I'll explain how we're doing this sort of in partnership with, with the mapping she's um, that she's working on. Um, but yeah, you can see some of these trends still today in, in neighborhoods. Economic vulnerability overlaps really, really closely with um, the Hispanic populations in neighborhoods. Um, throughout Colorado, and including Longmont, Latino families have faced considerable racism, exclusion, hardship since arriving here. And today, still 25% of Longmont's total population is Spanish speaking. Um, and there's this is part of a larger eff effort throughout the city to kind of acknowledge the past mistakes over the past 100 plus years um, at the city, rebuild that trust, and Right, yeah, build those relationships so that we can really, with genuine intent, equitably serve, um, include, and celebrate the Latino community here in Long Um The Community and Neighborhood Resource Team uh, here at Long so that's led by Carmen, who I know has presented to you guys before, um, they are amazing. They've already built relationships with so many communities, um, some of the lesser served communities specifically. Um, throughout Longmont, historically less reserved. Um, and so we're we're working really closely with Carmen in particular, um, but with that whole team to um, to utilize those relationships they already have built and um, and build relationships, build those relationships relationships out further with some of the work we're doing. Um, and we're also working with Again, those external organizations throughout Longmont that also serve and have relationships with those communities. Because um, it's really, it's not something that our department or me in particular, we like we don't have the ability to just go out and create all these relationships. We really need help. Um, so community assessment. This is the stage we're in right now. Um, we, as like a larger group, so including all of those external organizations, including me, including some folks from REC, we all got together and designed um, this community assessment strategy. And now, like as of a week ago, um, we're just starting to see that roll out. So we're in the very, very early stages of it. It will continue throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, what that looks like uh, is for elementary school, uh, elementary school age kids, we're doing nature play drawing activities and interviews. Um, so traditional surveys, the survey, same survey we have for adults obviously doesn't work well for all ages. So um, we're engaging kids of different ages in different ways to try to get their feedback on what barriers they have to the outdoors, um, as well as what they'd like to see in the outdoors and what kind of programming they would be interested in. Um, middle school, they have some sort of photo project, um, as well as high school. I'm not sure exactly what that looks like, but kids are taking photos of what they'd like to see um, and what prevents them from getting the outdoors and putting together some sort of project that we're then reviewing. Um, and then we're also conducting interviews and for high schoolers, we're doing focus groups as well. Um, family and adults, we're doing focus groups and surveying. And then for the broader community, uh, we have a survey put together, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and that's, we have three <coughs> hired bilingual interns, um, one or two of whom have participated in Lafayette's Nature Kids um, program, so they have a really good understanding of what this would look like eventually. Um, and then one uh, community leader who's in, like a woman in her 40s who speaks Spanish and is a, a kind of a cultural broker, community leader in one of our um, Spanish speaking, more heavily Spanish speaking neighborhoods. Um, so yeah, door to door, um, our community based organizations that are involved in this are also doing some surveying through their folks, and then we're also sending our survey out by email. Um, facilitation is done by a trained bilingual facilitator and the interns um, who will be working with, with kids and adults on all of this. Uh, so right now we're doing some private uh, pilot programming. Uh, we've done some youth and family volunteer projects just this morning and tomorrow. I was out with a group of like a dozen or so kids and we did a bilingual education slash uh, pollinator gardening event, um, and we have a handful more of those planned throughout the year. Uh, so more educational nature play opportunities. Uh, Thor is doing a summer camp at Rogers Grove, three sections of summer camp. 
um, which I think 80% of the kids who are attending have sponsored, um, their, their <coughs> fees are sponsored so that they pay very little or nothing. Um, and then free overnight camp at Calwood, which is up in the mountains, so that's a cool experience for a lot of kids. Uh, and then participation in Children, Youth, and Families Annual Youth Summit, as well as working with uh, the youth center pretty um, frequently. Um, the assessment, so we're focusing our assessment on, again, Spanish-speaking and low-income Spanish low communities. Um, and this is, again, funded with the 40K for Nature Everywhere right now. Um, I can show you guys the survey. It's pretty cool. Well, maybe. We'll see. Oh, gosh, it's showing up on the screen. <laughs> um, uh, just get out of your presentation. Because I yeah. get to the screen that it opened for you. Yeah, I don't have a mouse again. I don't have a mouse. <coughs> it's on the TV. It's so on the TV. You've got to slide it. Oh, okay, cool. One of the four That's directions okay. from the TV. Yeah. Thank you. Just move to one of the four sides and we'll put it on your screen. Yay, that's good. If not, I can read some of this to you. Yeah, if you just slide it, yeah. yeah. I don't understand. You keep saying that, but I don't know. It's here. Let's go here. Let's see where they're 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 here. Let's see where Hey, nice. That's great. Thank wow. you. Sure. I have no idea what you did. If you press the windows key and use the arrows, you can like move windows around with a mouse. Okay, cool. As long as you have a Alright, cool. So this is the survey. Uh, it's We also have it in Spanish. Um, and it's not just Google translated. This is actually translated by a paid translator. Um, these questions we came up with as a group. Um, and then we also had someone who's done these surveys before um, with Lafayette. She also helped design this. Um, it's 20 questions, and every question has, there's a strong reason to ask it, and there's something that we want out of those answers. Um, so you can see, you know, we, we want to know why people get outside. Is it health? Is it um, a sense of community? What is it that gets people outside? How do they access the outdoors? Um, how would they like to access the outdoors? Um, things that prevent you from spending time outside. Um, most of these offer the opportunity to click on several answers, which is cool. Um, and we also, I should add, Tatiana also worked in, with us in designing this survey, um, where she had um, input in, into these questions and, and these answers. So these are questions that she is being helpful for, for her work as well. Um, so this is, this is what the survey looks like. Um, at the end, we have some questions on what, you know, what language do you speak? Um, trying to get an idea of who's taking the survey. And most importantly, at least Tatiana would say most importantly, and I would too, um, we have a map so that people can click exactly if not exactly where they live, certainly like pretty darn close to where they live, so that we have an idea of what kind of answers we're getting from different neighborhoods, um, which will be really helpful, um, especially when it comes to like barriers to access and um, amenities that people would like to see in parks, we'll be able to tell where those answers are coming from, which is great. Um, so this survey is going out now. Um, we have a few results so far, not a ton. Um, this, a month from now, will be absolutely smattered with dots, um, but you can see we've got, we've got some answers already. Um, and these, of course, can be thrown into an Excel sheet. Um, 
How's the survey going out? Um, a number of ways. Email and then also like door to door on iPads. And then we also have iPads at our events um, that we're holding and have focus groups and all of that. So and it's not just available online. It's not currently just available like, on the website or anything. Um, we're trying to do sort of targeted survey surveying right now. Um, because we want to make sure that we're the results we're getting are hitting the neighborhoods and the people that we want to hit, at least at the start. Um, we'll see if this fall if we want to open it up and just put it on Facebook or something and get a whole bunch of results. But we want to make sure that first we're hitting the people we really want to hit. Um, so that's the gist. That's where we're at right now. Um, once we have these results in the fall, uh, we as part of the funding for Nature Everywhere, we have funding for someone to evaluate and analyze all of this. Um, and then we're also, uh, so City of Longmont, our GIS team put this survey and this mapping piece together. So it should be really easy for the city to, to take all of this data and analyze it and use it for whatever we want as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where we're at right now. Um, along with the pilot programming, which we'll run through in summer. Um, and once we have those answers, and once we've done some evaluation this winter, we will be designing next season um, in accordance with, with some of those ideas and some of the responses we get. And then that following fall slash winter, that's when we apply for the big money we go home, which again, we're, we're planning on getting. Um, but we'll be able to apply with very specific things in mind based on this community assessment. Can I have an idea for you as far as surveys? Um, back to school is in 30 seconds. <laughs> totally. Because that's what I was just working at. Um, the back to school, um, when people come and get their books and when people come and do their registration, that's a great time, um, especially to be at some of the um, schools where there are underserved communities. Mm -hmm. um, but, Worked at one, and I know like lots of people come to that back to school when you get your books and registration. Yeah. So if you could hit Indian Peaks and Timberline and Skyline and and, and actually Nywat too, like people think of Nywat, but Nywat is, totally. is very diverse um, and has a lot of lot of monsters. Right, yeah. that's a really good idea. I'll definitely pass that along. Yeah, that's a great idea. Any other questions? Is there any thought to doing an in-school program? Yes, um, Lafayette did, mm -hmm. as, as you know. <laughs> um, I don't have any, currently have it much of a relationship with, well, the city as a whole doesn't have a, huge, a strong relationship with Longmont, uh, St. Frank Valley School District as a whole. Right now, anytime we work with the school district, it, it tends to be with individual schools. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a piece that, assuming there's a need for that, which I think there people will be asking for that, we have to figure that piece out um, because we'll want to do it on, I think doing it kind of piecemeal school by school is probably not the most efficient or effective way to go about that. Um, so we'd have to have some bigger conversations with the school district. You know, we just have so many schools here compared to Lafayette, yeah, it's a little different, but right. it is the way to be equitable, mm -hmm. um, Definitely. because a lot of kids don't have parents that will sign them up for anything, Right. period, and being able to reach those kids right. is, for those of you who know, I'm the person who does the in-school for Nature Kids Lafayette. I, I do all of that from, and so... Um, being able to reach those kids has been really, really powerful. Changed a lot of kids' lives completely. Kids that go to school now that didn't go to school. And, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. so if we can do that, it would be great. I because, agree. Yeah. yeah, because these aren't kids whose parents will ever sign them up for a thorn. Right. And, you know, and as, as accessible as you try to make out-of-school programming, mm -hmm. it's just not accessible to a lot of folks. You know, parents work evenings, parents work weekends. Kids don't have a way to get places. And then um, also, if you have it with the mix of kids that do have access, and that it actually increases the success, just like having a special education program is you don't just put kids that don't have any access to nature with other kids that don't, because then everybody's a little lost and 
you know, they don't have their peer role models, but if you have different people, I found the most successful classes are, are, have some kids that go skiing every weekend and some kids that have literally never gotten to go to the park by themselves because they're so scared, so yeah. So let me know if there's going to be schools in Okay, yeah, yeah, I will. I'll keep you on the follow list. Great. Yeah. Like it's along really well. Totally. I'll come back um, once we have survey results. I'll, I'll update you guys again before we start next season. Cool. Very exciting. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Oh, and you should hit up Casa de la Esperanza. As yes. Well. They are, we already, they're involved already. Okay. So we're good. All right. Our second business item is discussing our. Council's motion to draft the open space tax extension ballot language as a company pass. Yes. Yes. We got um, direction from council two weeks ago to bring um, open space tax language back for review, and so that's going to be happening on the 23rd. But um, the lead up to that, you know, everything is due long before that. So we're we're in the process of working on that, and we've also developed a PowerPoint, which we're which is a little drafty, but we're debuting debuting with you tonight. Um, and that's because a lot of a lot of discussion happened during the council on the 25th of June, and so um, we heard those questions and we're trying to address them here with this as kind of a lead into that like that language, the draft language that we want to present to council. So we're not going to be looking at language tonight. We're just going to be looking at the presentation because the language still needs to go through attorney and all of that. So it's not it's not ready, but this is ready ish. Um, so, always talking about open space, we, it's, it's critical that we start with our land acknowledgement. So, we acknowledge that Longmont sits on the traditional territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and other indigenous peoples. We honor the history and the living and spiritual connection that the first peoples have with this land. It is our commitment to face the injustices that happen when the land is taken and to educate our communities, ourselves, and our children to ensure that these injustices do not happen again. So, coming back to you after hearing what, what various council members were bringing up, these were kind of the questions that we uh, boiled it down to, and that's what this presentation is about. How does Longmont balance open space acquisition with housing, primary employment, and development? This was a lot of the stuff that Councillor Martin was talking about. And then how do we evaluate open spaces when considering an acquisition? Also, Councillor Martin was um, discussing this. Can we maintain the open spaces we own and those we may acquire in the future? What is the cost to maintain open space? And why should we extend the open space tax now? What does long-term stewardship look like? So, um, so if we think about um, the progression of our very young open space program that started in the year 2000, um, this graphic maybe needs a little work, but hopefully you can see that it's a little bit divided into thirds. So that at the very beginning, so throughout, you see the blue below, throughout there's operations and maintenance. But when the program began in the year 2000, a lot of purple. We were really focusing on acquisitions, and then you get into this middle third where we, where we are now. There's a lot of um, maintenance going on, less acquisition, and starting on restoration is where where we're going. And then you can see the final third 
the long-term stewardship of, of our open spaces. You're going to see a lot of, you know, restoration and stewardship is going to take over. There'll still be perturbations of acquisitions and, and open space, I mean, and operations and maintenance will continue. Does that make sense? Is the idea that chart would be like relative funding or expenditures? Yeah, like you, you okay. can think of it that way. Um, you know, because the open space tax funds all three of these, all three of these things, and if you think of the progression and the, and how the program transitions over time, lots of acquisitions, always maintenance, but then a little more restoration coming in, and then a lot more restoration coming in while the the acquisitions are falling off. Does that make sense? Do you have that accounting historically? Like, do you know how much was spent in two thousand four on acquisition versus stewardship or? I mean, it's not, right. there's no like table that okay. says that, but. So that's yes. a small chart, not a yes. actual chart. Yes, if we have like an intern that could put, put all our files together, we could get yeah. that, yeah. But yes. Um, I'm just going to note too, I mean, we talked about this a little bit on the field trip, that there is a relationship between maintenance and the restoration piece, in that the restoration in some cases can reduce that need for sort of investment. Yeah, maintenance over time. I know, and I, I you know, tried to and capture just, it a little, like you see, yeah. I spread it out a little bit. This is, I, I think, draft fine, but you should pull it. I'm just suggesting that you pull that out. That you know, when you do things like prescribed burning or you know, getting rid of invasives and replacing replacing with natives, you know, like over time, ideally, it becomes more self sustaining. Yeah, and your maintenance costs go down. You're so right. So it's just an it could show better in this graphic in that final third, and then. Than talking about that here, so we, yeah, so we talk about this a little bit, but that's a good note. Well, maybe even a picture of one, how you, how something came in to the system, and now with maintenance and restoration and stewardship. We will get there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is we're just I have the acquisition circle because I'm trying to focus here on the just the acquisition piece, but we're we're this graphic you're going to see a, a few times. Throughout the presentation, which is um, okay. So where was I? The the first question: How does Longmont balance open space acquisition with housing, primary employment, and development? Um, so we look at our Envision Longmont comprehensive plan, which the city um, adopted in 2016, and we look at our open space master plan, which the city adopted in 2018. And when we look at the, when we look at Envision Longmont, let's see, um, the comprehensive plan, in there you see that we have growth framework objectives. So that's getting at housing, primary employment, and development. And then we also think about that in the context of future land use planning. So we speak about the, our municipal service areas, the Longmont planning area, and then the greater St. Vrain Valley planning area. So that's that's what we see in Envision Longmont around this question. And then if you look in the open space master plan, well that's, sorry, that's we're not ready for that. That's question two. Um, so if you, um, I want to show you this. So if you think about the growth framework, it's it's uh, the getting at housing and primary employment and development. The Longmont planning area is this yellow line. So that planning largely happens in the inside the planning area, whereas open space acquisition largely happens outside that planning area. There are exceptions. We do have nature areas within the Longmont planning area, and those are areas that were not necessarily purchased with open space funds, but are, are um, operated and maintained with open space funds and are used as open spaces, you know, not, they're not parks, they're open spaces inside the planning area. So, and then getting to question two, how do we evaluate open spaces when considering an acquisition? We look at our before you jump to question two, I, if you can go back to question one. Yeah. So I actually think, and you know, we've discussed this here, 
I might ask the reverse question, which is how does the city evaluate the need for open space and natural areas when considering permitting for housing and development? So, I mean, this reflects a particular bias mm -hmm. in this question, but I think it's important that we, like, it's also important that the city think about open space and natural areas in the way that they do that kind of permitting and thinking about housing because you're not going to get the quality of life they aim for. I do like that idea. So, I like that mm -hmm. concept. And I feel like it's it's a little bit done here when we, when we look at the um, growth goals in Envision Long Lot here, but then you see this context of the future land use plan and it's kind of laid out in this context. So I need to think about yeah, the bias and in that question. I think both of those questions are important. Like, how are we thinking about yeah. you know, housing and employment needs in regard to open space, but also how are we making sure that we're thinking about open space and natural area needs in these, you know, multitude of land use decisions that are happening. What brought people in long run yes. was not, right. uh, you know, streets and parking lots. Right. That's great. Right. Exactly. That's really good. Yeah. Thank you. I like that. I was concerned about that, about the the phrasing. Phrasing. Yeah, and and, and how it's phrased can really inform how where the discussion goes. Yeah. Um, so if we move on to the second question, how do we evaluate open spaces when considering an acquisition? That that was discussed, and um, we have a very clear. You know, discussion around this in our open space master plan. So, some of the things that um, we heard during the discussion is, you know, our open space division always brings acquisitions before city council, so that um, there is, you know, they have the final say. It's it's not staff. It's city council. Um, so there's that. But then also in the open space management plan, how do we start? We have um, a description of that in the open space management plan here, talking about the filters. So, what are we doing first? You know, we're looking we're looking at the parcel in consideration, and we're looking at some of these some of these things here in this broadest filter. We're using mapping tools. We're looking at the criteria that are laid out in our ordinance, um, and then we get a little finer here in, in um, tier two willingness of the seller, things like that, and then the, the finest filter, tier three. So um, this will get a little bit more developed for the city council presentation, but it's in tier two, how we're getting at it. We're talking about that ecosystem services, you might connect it to climate adaptation, particularly in communities that are, you know, like the ones Taylor was talking about, that are, you know, more, inter more impacted you know, have less street cover, maybe more, you know, subject to flood risk. That's another value of open space and natural areas. Yeah. But we I think you talk talk about, we like talked that. about it, but just pulling that out and the connection to climate and climate-related risk to communities. The role that open space and natural areas can play. It's just a frame, you know, mm -hmm. that information in there. This is a this is a presentation that's going to city council. If I understand right, am I understanding right? This is like we're previewing something that's going to go to city council to educate city council about all this. Correct. Correct. We've been in front of city council twice in June. With we brought you a presentation. It was way back in September twenty twenty three, and then Susie the level fairing asked for council to have an open space presentation. So we did that and talked about our past, present, and future, and the program, just to really, with the new members of council and stuff, to really kind of ground them in that that basis. And then we did the open space tour with PRAP and city council for a second time this summer. And then there's been a lot of public and residents coming and talking about the open space tax. And again, they came on the 25th, and after that, discussion, council asked staff to work on this and to come back on the 23rd and give them draft language. Um, and that's a, at that time, they'll, they'll vote to um, 
recommend it be on the November ballot. So this is to educate city council, but also to educate all the people that are concerned enough to be there. And to address all the discussion that happened along yeah. with the motion that, that council made. There were two motions made. Mm -hmm. One to, to refer it to the ballot, but also Councilor Martin um, directed staff to come back and address some of the things that she was talking about, and we were trying to capture it here in, in some of these, the first two questions here. Yeah. Well, actually, the first, well, I mean, so, well, I see question two. So I was thinking about this because I was trying to think of our audience. Is that often that, like, as smart as our city council people are, um, it, the, all this language is, is tough, like, it's tough, and it's tough to look at, like, What's the filter? But I feel like an example of one of the things that we just using an example because that's how people learn. And so we're trying to teach city council and then anybody who's there. So if we could have an example of the filter, like just a real quick one, like less than one minute example of oh, sure, sure. The filter, I see. this, this, um, like the one that we, that's like by Circle K, this barn, it was about to be donated to us. So like the filter we want, do, you know, what service, like just go like maybe a 30 second, then we checked out to see if this, and then we checked out to see that. That's how we filter. And just giving an example like that will really help people internalize what this says and feel, make, maybe feel it. Well, I think there's something else got to be, uh, Councillor Martin's discussion on this, I'm not convinced that all of council is is against this concept or adding stuff or or focusing on uh, uh, housing in this particular uh, situation. I think that was her uh, her uh, thinking. You know, probably more uh, prompted by organizations like Launch that she's pretty actively involved with, and others like that. So that's where I felt like some of this was coming from, not necessarily uh, all of council feeling that way. I think most of council is pretty understandable of the necessity, the importance, and the, and the value uh, to the community of open space. Yeah, and really this presentation was just addressing some specific questions that came from yeah. council. Yeah. And that's, 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 yeah, that's exactly, exactly. but I was just thinking like maybe, because then if you make it really plain, to people like Councillor Martin, but with everybody else, then they can't deny it. Like that, now they know we do have a filter. We don't just be like we don't I take agree. it really, really. We yeah. have an example, things like that. Really, just make it really up plainer make, than plainer than plain. Argument. Make the argument. So, if I don't mind, I said to say to the end, but I really, I think sometimes Jeff and I talk about you know how this board feels like they're adding value. This group really had a week to turn around getting stuff ready mm -hmm. for council. They have a little more time to get the PowerPoint ready because they show up at that, but getting stuff ready is going to be tough. And we really are counting on this group to do exactly what you're doing. So mm -hmm. to your question, um, this really is helping <coughs> us hone this and get it ready so it can answer council's questions and to your point page and both of you are it's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And kind of get a chance to talk about our program and help others understand too, it's great. So one, I want to thank Jim Danielle for being up here being vulnerable with a very rough presentation, they just walk around. It doesn't look, it doesn't look good enough to me. It looks but great. They, they were they were just as they left the office working on it and willing to put in front of you all to help them with it. Well, I'm like doing this as collaborative. Like, let's say we were teaching a class together, and like, okay, let's give an example, right? Like that's because I'm coming from an educator's viewpoint because we're trying to educate them on why that why open space is important. Darn it. Well, this helps me <laughs> as a council member to reiterate. What this board's interested in, what we want, and uh, and and not a whole lot of. I, I don't want this to go off the rails. Uh, that's my biggest concern. I, I'm a little concerned that it could, uh, and not due to the fact that you haven't prepared uh, plenty for this, and that the the our legal department won't have the the ballot language created. I'm, I'm just afraid that somehow somebody will try to yeah without the examples that uh, uh commissioner aaron is, uh, Angel is talking about that we really we could very well go off the rails and that's that's concerning yeah that's the way, so that's the way things are to help us yeah. hear what those rails are and that's we really appreciate that and i think it's one of the things that um 
uh, again, I think this group really lessons learned from some of the rec stuff. We're looking at that too and seeing where these things have gone off rails. We're trying to get in front of that a little bit too. It's just a lot, but I do think that we have the right people looking at it. And I think as much as you can dissuade a conversation from hitting like housing and employment against open space and natural areas because they're complementary. They're not things that are opposed. It shouldn't be either or. It's not like we would want like wild wall housing with no natural areas or just natural areas with no place to live. I mean, I might want that, but you can have a little family your commune. That would be great. But, yeah. I, so I think you know, like steering away from the idea that those. You know, we have to choose. It's more about how do we make it the appropriate I think we balance. want to make sure that the council members raise those questions, know that they were heard there, too. Right. So mm -hmm. I think framing it a little bit differently is a great way. <coughs> Scarcity mindset versus abundance mindset. Okay, so what I was getting you through questions one and two. We kind of got there. I'm mm -hmm. going to hand it off to Jim, and he's going to do the, the maintenance and long-term stewardship pieces. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't know me, I'm Jim Crick, ecosystem manager for City of Longmont, so kind of Danielle's counterpart. So Danielle's really active in acquiring our open spaces and, help, and helping build our portfolio, and then gets handed off to my work group to kind of uh, perform this maintenance and eventually uh, we'll get to restoration. Um, if you want to the next slide. So yeah, uh, to talk about that third question of do we have you know, enough funding currently for what our current inventory is to do, to do this maintenance and what does it look like if we add more uh, open space land to our um, portfolio where we have the ability to manage, manage those properties as well. So um, from that past diagram, there's that continuation of maintenance. And so that's just always ongoing. And it really, that comes down to mostly like natural speed control, wildlife management, kind of the basic stuff. Um, I kind of think of it as, you know, when we acquire properties, as, as beautiful as much of our open spaces and our nature areas are, if you really get down to the nitty gritty of their ecological function, pretty much all of them um, are in pretty degraded state. Um, it's just the nature of acquiring properties that were, uh, I mean, for lack of a better term, abused <laughs> by past landowners. Um, whether it's, you know, they were just overgrazed or who knows, they were mined, whatever. They're neglected. Neglected. Yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> so, um, so they all come into our into our inventory with, with needs of help. Um, if you want to think of it as, you know, each property coming in is like a patient in a hospital. They've had some level of, of ailment that needs to be worked on. And so we're really in this maintenance phase, uh, before we get into long-term stewardship and restoration, is, is really just trying to stabilize those properties, um, if you want to think of it like a patient. Um, so... Um, to get to that question of do we have enough money, uh, funding to be able to do this maintenance, um, it's honestly a really difficult question to, to answer. Because um, like with each patient, you know, they have a different level of ailment and how much work is it going to take. So um, basically the best way that I could come up with um, a cost estimate for like a per acre of maintenance for our properties was to really take our existing uh, O and M budget and kind of divide that by the acres that we manage as uh, and uh, for natural properties. Um, I do want to make that distinguish distinguish being uh, characteristic between natural lands and our ag properties. So we do have open spaces that are um, agricultural production and some that are for more like wildlife habitat. Um, our ag properties. Really, most of that maintenance is a requirement of those uh, ag tenants, so there's very little o &M that we put towards ag properties. So I really wanted to focus on the natural gas maintenance where most of our o &M goes to. Um, so dividing that out, we come up with about $340 per acre for um, maintaining um, our natural land type properties, so our open spaces, nature areas, and recreating corridors. Um, so to then get into that question of, you know, are we going to have enough money to manage any more acquisitions? Um, so if you're looking at, we add a 100-acre property that's about $34,000 per acre, uh, or total, based off our per acre price that it would cost to do our, our continuing maintenance. Um, that $34,000, if you want to put that in perspective, um, that's about, uh, I wanted to say that was roughly five, 3% of our overall O&M budget. It's like $1.1 million that we spend annually. 
Um, and then if you want to look at that compared to uh, what our open space fund brings in from our uh, sales and use tax, which is roughly about $6 million a year, we're looking at less than um, about half of 1% of our overall um, revenue that comes in every year from our open space tax. So I would say that we would have enough money to uh, continue to expand our program um, and also maintain what we currently have. Um, and then, um, as far as how many FTEs that we have for, for our current uh, properties, we have roughly 6.75 FTE. Um, so we'd have to add, you know, maybe 300 acres of open space where I may be looking to request another technician to help to control the project management. And then, going into that last question, why are we uh, looking to extend the open space tax now when we have 10 years left before it sunsets? Um, and really that gets into, um, if you want to go to the next slide, into this long-term restoration and stewardship. Um, for those that were on the open space tour, we kind of mentioned that this uh, planning for restoration and stewardship and actually implementing restoration and stewardship is a long-term commitment. Um, if you want to go to the next slide? So we, I kind of put together a mock uh, restoration plan. I'm not saying this is what needs to be done at Golden Ponds, um, but this is kind of an example of what could be done for, for restoration. So long-term restoration is, is really continuing with noxious weed control, actually going in and seeding um, and trying to replace non-native vegetation with native vegetation, which like Paige you were mentioning. Once we get that going, that really helps with long-term uh, reducing that long-term maintenance. But the best defense against noxious weeds are having uh, really well-developed perennial native vegetation. Um, and then we get into potential stream restoration on the same frame, for example, um, and then trying to implement prescribed fires and grazing, which um, are really critical for natural systems as they have uh, natural disturbance like grazing and fire that these ecosystems evolve with um, to, to maintain those systems in perpetuity. So I'll go to the next one. So with Can that, I try on Golden Ponds first. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so with that, I tried to put together some sort of uh, timeline for a restoration plan like, like we were talking about for Golden Ponds and some cost to that. Um, so you can see for all these different um, phases of a restoration plan, uh, we're easily, easily getting out into 20 years. And really, you know, restoration, if you include that monitoring, which is really important for making sure that the actions that we take are actually working, if we're not monitoring, we don't know if what we're doing is actually making any positive impact or not. So if you really want to include monitoring, you could say restoration happens in perpetuity. Um, adaptive management. Yep. So that's kind of how we do our, our adaptive management to not get too off on a, on a different tangent. But really, um, to, to manage a property uh, well, uh, you really determine what needs to be done, uh, implement a plan, and then you monitor and see if that's working. If it's not working, then you go back to square one. So with that, um, this kind of phase plan is just everything goes absolutely perfectly, which doesn't happen all the time. Um, particularly, like say, if for seeding, um, if we don't get enough rain for seeding, it's not gonna take, and then we have to go right back to square one and try to seed again and continue to weed control. So this is, this is you know, if everything happens perfectly, which rarely happens. Um, so you can see that uh, having that long-term stability of knowing that our open space funding is going to be here for long haul, then we can really start uh, getting into this planning and figuring out what each of our properties really needs to be, um, what needs to happen on each property long-term to get them in that kind of self-sustaining um, uh, ecosystem management. So kind of looking at what some of those costs are, uh, we get into... Um, um, another reason why having that uh, funding in perpetuity and having that stability is really important is that restoration is not cheap. You can see a cost estimate here of $2.3 million uh, to implement this, this mock plan. Um, a lot of that is from stream restoration, uh, but overall I think that still gets to kind of a uh, cost estimate from our uh, open space tour of that seven to $10,000 per acre for, for long-term restoration needs. Um, so it's, it's definitely not inexpensive. Um, but that goes back to that uh, graphic that we keep showing is that we have to balance acquisitions, restoration needs, maintenance. Um, so there's always that give and take uh, really between what Danielle and I are planning um, long term for our program of 
Um, you know, it may be Danielle realizes, you know, we don't have enough water for this property. We need to try to get money uh, together to acquire more water. So at that point, we can discuss and say, okay, let's take a step back for maybe doing some restoration this year on the property and try to fit in that water acquisition. So we can always balance that in and adjust where we're spending that money. Um, and having that flexibility, I think, is really important, uh, particularly for land acquisitions, because you never know when a, a property seller is going to be um, willing to sell the property that we may be targeting. Um, it, you know, it could happen tomorrow. It could happen 10 years from now. We, we really have no idea. So having that flexibility is really important and not trying to um, say that only a certain amount of, of the open space tax should be used for this you know, acquisition or for restoration. It, that, that really makes it difficult to long term plan too. Um, one thing that we do need to add a slide for in the discussion that um, has been discussed previously with, with residents that have brought it up to council is that um, besides our ability to maintain open space properties and nature areas, we do, the city does have a pretty large inventory of property that was not acquired with open space dollars, uh, such as Plot Rock Preserve that uh, was acquired with water funds that because of the way the tax language is written for our open space tax, we cannot use our open space tax dollars to manage and do any maintenance or restoration of that butt rock, um, which I would argue is a pretty important property. Um, it's roughly 3,000 acres, so almost double our open space inventory. Uh, that's where two thirds of Longmont's drinking water comes from. Um, it has pretty significant wildlife habitat. Uh, Danielle um, completed the uh, Butt Rock Management Plan, was that two years ago now? Seems like just yesterday. Um, but that identified a whole slew of, of management needs up there um, for natural resource management that honestly hasn't been done up there. Um, you know, rightfully so, our water resource department, you know, their main focus is on quality and quantity of water delivery. Um, doing wildlife surveys and managing the elk, managing the elk range up at Bun Rock, it's not really a, you know, part of their core mission. Um, so that's something that we are looking into in, in drafting uh, the ballot language for open space tax, is crafting it in a way, we don't want to open a Pandora's box and can of worms where everybody's going to try to use open space tax for whatever they think they can, but really try to craft that language specifically um, to be able to do um, the necessary land management, uh, not just open space acquired properties, but properties like Butt Rock that are really important for um, the community, but also um, just the ecosystem in general. Okay, go ahead. Can you go back to the, this, uh, the initial budget slide where you started oh, talking about the numbers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just encourage, you know, I know you were like sort of working through the logic in your mind, but yeah. when you present it, like I would just make it as simple and clear as possible. Like, you know, just work out whatever makes the most sense to you to say and just share that because I think people might get lost and I'm sort of looking that's to you. I think really, people really my biggest might get lost mm -hmm. in some of the like background detail you would. And so I would just say, you know, based on our current costs, you know, whatever logic makes most sense to you, I would just make it really simple and kind of straightforward sure. and state it. Um, and maybe you were going to do that because I know you were just kind of sharing your thinking with us. So mm -hmm. that's just one thing. And then on the um, on the graph, like I wonder, I'm just, I, I feel like the visual is not necessarily communicating. I wonder if you could just do, I don't know if you could do it by year over the start of the program, but if you just did like, colored bars for each year so you could see like the relative you know purple blue green like maybe there's a lot of purple initially and then it transitions to like yeah, so not, green versus well like wall you know in each for each year i don't know i would just work with I hear, it. I, I, hear, hear, I hear work on it it's yeah not, it's not like it's you should it's not yeah, a yeah. thousand words right now. It is already Yeah, because I keep thinking like, <laughs> this are the down arrows like expenditure or like you know like oh, a no. balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And then oh. the last thing um, on the where you were doing the example of the long term restoration mm -hmm. piece. Um, I liked the sort of picture, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could talk to it more, like. Again, I worry about the detail in your 
Grass. Sounded nice. Imagine you're a wreck person again. <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, I feel like this might become overwhelming and feel like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to have this for every open space. And that feels. So I wonder if you could stick to the picture mm -hmm. and just talk about what that, like, just use that image and talk more about what the restoration might look like over time. We might start with the weeds and you know, getting to the native plants, and here's the benefits, and then we might work on the stream restoration. Just yep. because I feel like this would be like well, scary to some people. Criticism might be, are those dollars constant? Uh, when we know yeah. when we know that they're not, and that uh, it's likely some of those things, uh, the grazing costs could go up, and uh, yeah. it, I mean, everything would probably go up. for us, but yeah. I think just for yeah. general. Yeah, I think this shows really well the interplay between the maintenance and the restoration. I would just show this graph with no numbers. Okay. This timeline. And I think just, people just see numbers and get distracted by the large numbers. Sure. Yeah. So what you're showing really is the interplay of like momentary events that have long term, uh, multi year investments required. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the yeah. dollar amount is important. It could be 10 to that or 10 times that in the property. Okay. Sort of like this is yeah. how things work. The As we get numbers, people start doing the math for you too. They say, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're going to go, say, well, I can't oh, read that. Do you have your yeah. copy? Yeah. Right. And you're like, no, I can't. I really like that example, the golden plants. That's exactly yeah. what I was talking about with that. It's just having an example for somebody to think it through. Like you could even just use, like when we thought of acquiring golden ponds, this was the filter it went through. And then we're going to keep using this golden ponds example. And then I like what Paige said about like tying it in, all these things, how making sure that you tie them in because like grazing, well, that tells you that we need more grazing is something that tells you we need more open space because if we don't have a wildlife corridor, we don't have the natural grazing of the ungulates, right? And if we have a good wildlife corridor, then we have natural grazing, which is supposed to be there in the first place, which is why we have to keep restoring things is mm -hmm. because we're... We've damaged the, we have damaged the ecosystem. I worry that if we talk about it as a hospital patient, that critical people will say, why are we buying somebody who's so sick? So if we talk about just like annual, like you need to go to the doctor and some different time, like all of us need to, to take care of ourselves kind of thing. You need to go to the doctor and sometimes you find out, whoa, it's going to cost a little more money this year because of something. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Then, it's, it's, then we're acquiring like you and me, not like the like adopting the sick puppy that you know <laughs> needs four new hips and. Mm -hmm. But I think what things that you mentioned was that you know that we have, when we acquire them, the shape they're in, and unfortunately with the open space program, a lot of times we are taking yeah. on mm -hmm. properties that Danielle used to neglect it, but they were a former. Gravel mines, or a former, or I mean, these are the opportunities to get sometimes to make these things. They were, they were farms that you know had been in town for a long time, and now they're at the end of that. So um, I, I, I try to bridge yeah. that too. That you know, yeah. it takes a lot when we get these. They do need some TLC up front. Then they need that long term care, and then you need the restoration. Another piece I wanted to throw out there too for this group and Daniel, I think as Jim was talking about Golden Pond, some more people because you talk about the split work. Danielle is writing operating plans for all these properties and, and going through and saying, here's the condition we got again, and here's where we want it to go. So Golden Ponds is like a snapshot of all these properties yeah. and how we're trying to write these master plans to say where we want them to be. But That's what I think is the snapshot is really good. Just say, for example, Golden Ponds, and then it just simplifies it. Yeah, it's it a great example. Everybody loves Golden Ponds. We all see the value in it. Okay. You know what I mean? But we... But, then I keep having questions like, why do we allow people to mine our land and leave it crappy? Like, I, I like every, everything. <laughs> that's what I, like, I don't know. I like that's like, you just pose that right back to city council. Let me be there, and I could just be like, if it well, wasn't Robert's Rules of Order, I'd be like, yeah. You let them build the Walmart, but you know the Walmart's going to go out of business, and then we're going to have to deal with that parking lot. Why did you let that happen? Wait, you're letting it happen all the time, like so. Yeah, I mean, a, lot of the, a lot of the gravel mine, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of control right. over. Um, particularly yeah. with, even the reclamation plan that's with the state, and so we try to have some input as we go along and, and try to make improvements to that. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of properties we, we acquired 
that those gravel mining rights were already acquired before the city even got the property yeah. and already had a reclamation plan. So it, it, we, we try to do our best in those situations, um, but a lot of times it's already been decided. <laughs> on slide eight, though, uh, you then said at the end of it, and we need to probably give an example, that if you were to bring on a certain number, uh, another so many acres, what that would look like. Uh, you, you said uh, quickly, uh, you know, that'd be another employee or that'd be another three employees. Uh, just that probably needs to be uh, maybe shown, or mm -hmm. at least uh, if you're going to say it, uh, either don't say it, or if you're going to say it, then show the, the information so people understand that that when you bring on an extra, um, uh, uh, you know, 100 acres or something like this, or 50 acres, that equates to another employee and, and, and everything. Okay. And also you can equate it a whole different way is that instead of it costs us employee, is that we get to give employment to, to another employee yeah, gets a it's, good it's, it's an employee good job. generator that's <laughs> no, I, I mean, I mean, that's, good. that's what you know what councilman martin keeps saying is like we need more jobs well i'm not sure because we're you know i'm not sure if we do but uh my i might beg to disagree but let's let's hit where they let's hit yeah where oh, that like we get to a, give it's somebody an employee a job generating situation yeah. and um doing something that they would probably love because this is a great job. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So is there a, I was just looking at this, CSU did this ROI analysis on the um, Colorado's easement tax credit program. And you know, like what is the benefit to Colorado taxpayers of this tax credit we have mm -hmm. for conservation easements? And it, you know, it's huge. I don't know if there's anything similar for I mean, I can share this, the most recent yeah. study with you. I don't know if it would be relevant to like city open space, but there is an ROI in terms of like the benefit to community mm -hmm. of the acquisition of open spaces and conservation. Yeah. Well, it's like there is. We did get into this a little bit. We did try and get after this the, the when we gave our past, present, and future presentation, just giving an overview of of the program and. Um, it's not the honest piece. It might be worth too. bringing it. Just I'll send this to you if you haven't seen yeah. it. Well, and even at the last, well, second to last council presentation when we gave that prior to your presentation, there was the Walmart Economic Development. Yeah. I forget what group they're called. But they provide a couple of stats, actually two different groups provide stats of, I forget what it was, like almost 8% of the people that visit Walmart said they visit Walmart because of the outdoors. Something, you know. Yeah. Oh, I put that in here. I put, that's in here somewhere. <laughs> well, maybe I just said it. Yeah, I think the lady said something about it. I would almost go back to that, that uh, meeting and look at what both those folks uh, in Fawcett mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, yeah, we look at the Yeah, and just quote them. Mm -hmm. It's it's public record. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty two pretty powerful stats that came out of it. Yeah. One is visit Longmont, and one is is the economic development program. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's that's our presentation in the works. Thanks for this good. Give you all this <laughs> yeah, yeah, and thanks for sharing with us and letting us give you feedback. Yeah. Yeah, that's just so nice. But. Well, I wanted to hear, I didn't hear much um, feedback about that, um, the discussion about uh, the expanded use of open space tax for places like Red Rock. Um, I don't know if anybody had any thoughts about that or concerns. Or <gasps> to me, it's for sure, that is open space. Just because you don't buy it, like, just because I, you know, got something from buy nothing doesn't mean mm -hmm. I don't have to wash the skirt that I got from buy nothing, right? right? Like, you still got to take care of stuff just because it didn't go to course. Yeah, I would, I would, you know. I would say less of like expanding and more of aligning the uh, availability of funds to the open spaces that are going to show the city. Mm -hmm. I think there's a distinction between like 
lowercase open space, uppercase open space, that only matters to people who are in this meeting and in, this, right. in the city. That um, the public, I was going to point earlier, like you mentioned, the public wanted to become a long one for access to open space. A lot of that's not actually capital O open space they're accessing, right? It's city parks and MLBs or places that are acquired one way and held in a different way. And those distinctions are important at a planning level and at a like, policy and acquisition level, but in public, it's really simple. It's like, we want to better maintain the access to the outdoors that we all have. Mm -hmm. And Button Rock is not different from an agricultural lease in, other than how you describe it. Right. And so I think it's important just to like, not say it as expanding the use of funding, more like aligning <coughs> a, a previous very specific tax to what we actually do managing today. I appreciate that a lot, because I think for us, it do always hit on the large case open space and the small small case open space is a transparency thing. I think we as staff do not want to get across saying, what are you doing? We want to be a transparent conversation. I think the way you framed that was perfect. Because I, I think open space, the, the capital open space program does, does three different things to me. Like It focuses on spaces that, that are going to be preserved in, in a natural state and maybe restored natural state as just habitat and ecology that are valuable by themselves. Mm -hmm. It acquires agricultural space and we plan for leases, which there's no public access to, but they are of value in their own way. Then there's open space that's intended for public access or potential trails and use and picnicking and what have you. And the public doesn't really, I think, think of it that way. No. And they may expect things are different when they have access to all the space that they're buying. Mm -hmm. And that articulation of why those things are each individually valuable is really important. Not for this meeting necessarily, but I think that it's a really hard thing to get to good understanding on without spending like a couple hours really learning about it. And so we have to recognize that people have their own presuppositions of what it means to be open space. And um, the council may as well. So the, the, the council's chance to educate, I think, because they have asked you to. Spirit, you can go in there, but it is complex. My only concern would be is if it becomes, uh, I don't know, something that complicates the process of the process. Like, you know, so, you know, I love the idea. I think it's great to put it out there, and then I don't know if you have an opportunity to do like any kind of polling or anything to understand whether there's like language with that expansion versus language out. There's no type. No. No. Yeah, I, I think you're right, though. I think that's something yeah. we need to talk about. Definitely, is this this one that's thing we, we get off we get off the rails yeah. by doing that? So, not a spin just a perspective shift to we'd like to you permission to use this money to maintain and take care of all of our outdoor lands that we've acquired through whatever means we've acquired them like you know we got a bargain somebody else paid for it but we still need to take care of it like that's just Continue. like yeah to, well, except for we're not going to continue to take care of it because in some of them we don't have the money to take care of it. But we need that money to go to Button Rock. Like we need, I, yeah, we need some of the money that didn't go to the infrastructure of taking care of. Now we need to make sure we can fund that. So we want to make sure that we can fund the, the care for our land. And that to me is what the continuation of the open space is mostly should be focusing on not so much acquisition because the acquisition gets dicey but caring for land stewarding land and taking care of it and acquiring it where needed and where available and where it makes sense for our sense for our community is great but like care taking care of it mm -hmm. yeah, I, I like how you how, how you mentioned the, the wider the open space tax so a lot of open space tax with you know other other care for properties that the city owns that our residents expect us to care for that currently because of technicalities we can't. <laughs> so figuring out how to word that. Well, that's a, great. Actually, and what and you just said is like, like real English words. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, so for me, yeah. I think what I was hearing a little bit, I'd like to, as we think about this, is that those properties that meet those open space Value. So if this was a property you put through a filter, if we looked right. at button rot and put through that filter, it would be the first criteria, the second criteria, and the third criteria. And hopefully that would keep it from ending up like 
Here's a street that needs to be repaved, and it gets you from a park to a park, so let's use it for repaving streets. Oh, I like that. The filter. Yeah, I like I, that. Because, yeah, we it. don't want, like, yeah, mm -hmm. no, we don't want a willy-nilly. Like, I don't right. want to pay for my lemonade stand or whatever, you right. know. Yeah. Great. Are, are there concerns from this group of us at least having those conversations right now? With, with council? With council. <clears throat> no, that's great. I mean, I have concerns about the state of the world right now, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and like, and reaching any subject, period, in the right. state of the world right now is very yeah, dicey. It is. But mm -hmm. there's no guarantee it's going to get better. It may just get worse. So let's do it now. And it's like when the dentist gives you forewarning that in five years you're going to need a something. You know, like, yeah. Uh, thanks for thanks for the feedback. Yeah, the, the, the expand piece, I like I like the um, the the idea of alignment. Um, I lost my train of thought, but um, I think I like using the whole phrase ecological restoration in the language because we're speaking to it. It brings you back to the open space criteria, which you know we'll put in this presentation so you can see it, but like that phrase is different, you know, because if you if you have a different lens, if you're um, like putting utilities in or something, reclamation of land afterwards and rest, ecological restoration are, are different things with different purposes. And so to me, as a trained restoration ecologist, that's, that, that phrase has, has meaning and, um, makes anybody with any lens think about, oh, that's, well, that's different. I mean, that's not oil and gas reclamation, that's ecological restoration. It also blunts the idea that uh, it's all about this, uh, the focus on, on uh, you know, building housing and primary employment. It's, you know, those are things that we spend a lot more time focusing on as a community than we do any of this. So when this comes up, this needs to be the focus, and, and that we need to understand that it's not a, a it, it's a false choice to continue to try to push okay. that. I, I totally agree. I think it's a false either or that's presented, mm -hmm. and that in fact the open space strategy of the city is a hundred percent in alignment with the city's plan to develop and increase population of jobs. Like it's a hundred percent in alignment. And I think sustain quality of life. And the long and planning area is key to that, and it's like the most misunderstood thing. I, I talk to my neighbors about these kind of things. The most misunderstood part of development in the city is that this is all aligned to 40 years of planning in the city. And open space does not acquire within that area, and building does not generally happen outside of it. And those two things are in alignment, not in conflict. Right, right. And that's the core of the entire strategy. And this shows it really well, I think, but. It's still an underappreciated yeah, part of what moment is the way it is. Yeah, every chance you get, keep on coming back to it. So it's, yeah, because you know how it is when you're selling something to folks, you have to say it again and again and again. <laughs> and everybody knows uh, to buy a charm. <laughs> so. And I think there are certain words that do key into different demographics as well. Um, like ecological restoration, I agree, and that gets one set of demographics. But um, you look at very conservative um, farm owners and ranchers, and the words they use is take care of the land. And, and I think, so if you can slide take care of the land a few times in there, we're also, we're bringing, we're inviting in a whole group of other people instead of excluding them, them, you know, so like using different word choices mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and then yeah, repeating yeah. them yeah. over again, just really think yeah. those people. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, really do appreciate you again. <laughs> I'm all excited for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, thank you guys for that.
To go somewhere. Yeah, like that's to me is better. There's something I could receive that I have to put in place. There's nothing. This is great. Any other discussion from the packet updates from the board or from staff, I guess, but from us? Comments in the packet or questions from the packet? I did. So, with we don't have a date yet. For um, Isaac Wong being awarded, right? This is what it looks like. So historically, we've said that the detour is always going to be the same detour. But then there's language that said you could take because of the huge amount of time difference. Because now we're talking about late 2026 for this section to possibly be done. Um, when we revise that and say you could potentially detour off of Boston Avenue, or you're keeping the original detour. But then there is the other language that you can still walk a ride up to Boston Avenue once the bridge is complete. Good question. Yeah. And I'll have to get back to that one. Uh, and I will say I will support us pushing that forward and asking that question. I would be in favor of that as well. I just don't have the answer right now. But let me let me talk to that group over there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I hope that helps because again, that's one of the first things I did was your your right. board. I took right. step now starts at how can we fix this and it's it's not on our court, but we're willing to. I just need forward. to know better like, what their logistics are, but let me engage that those two that are running the Levy and the Boston Bridge project just to get a sense of when that's done, what stays intact, and what might become available. I just can't answer it without asking them, but I will. Okay. Questions? No, go ahead. I don't, so I have another question. So, <laughs> so the 22 versus 23 numbers looks like numbers are great. They go up by like uh, 11 percent. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then like, but like because rate increases, the revenue goes up 26 percent, right? So I mean, what's our what's your anticipated growth? I guess for 24. Because I mean, that, that's I a huge a projection for 24. Yeah, I mean we have yeah, we have budget so revenue, yeah, which you know we try to be conservative. So, so, so you know, we expect I, I think what you can the easiest way to look at that is to look at what I'm putting out monthly. That that can project. I'm not comfortable giving that out right to you guys right now because I don't I'm just not comfortable. Set solid enough. We've had discussions about why we have different ways of figuring out where we think we might want to be. We are projecting to be good, solid with budget this year in a good situation going into 24. We expect that the increases, the roughly 10% increases, hold. We certainly don't expect our numbers to go down. So, um, and at the same time, there's also growth because you see growth in participation see that um, across the board so so we expect both growth due to increases to increase for 25 but also growth to participation which no I won't keep continuing like it was for the last couple of years obviously we definitely we're back to maximum maximum capacity in a lot of cases um, i.e. day camp um, the rec center is very very busy at certain times to that world again, but we always have opportunities also. And then some of that's budget dependent. We have we have some good budget questions in right now, and we'll see how that pans out here in six weeks. Okay, because that was going to be <coughs> kind of a follow up question: is where is that plateau? If you are what eighty percent revenue is based on facilities, if you max out with facilities, you don't you really can't go anywhere. So with the, the stuff with cost recovery, we are working on a, a program for that. It's interwoven a little bit with the current budget. In fact, I have some stuff due to the budget books in the next couple of days um, that will put together some modeling. We do plan on taking forth a proposal to council in the next, 
I think you should share a little bit about that. Okay. Because you're, well, I don't want to say you up and not saying anything. Well, okay. <laughs> Thank you. It says it's okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, all we can do is propose. I mean, yeah. yeah. Council um, makes the decision. Yeah. yeah. So, so we have a new, essentially a new cost recovery model to propose um, based on that with the way things are, the new reality post COVID, with the way society is choosing to pay people at this time, um, the minimum wage being this high, work 40% roughly from what we were paying people rates in 2018, 2019. We can't grow that fast, that's impossible. And we can't, we, we can't and don't want to increase our rates like that, that prices people out. So we have, a new model that will reduce that cost from 80 to some other number, 70, 75. Well, that's what we're looking at kind of now. We'll about finalize. We're also looking at pulling some of the things we do, um, specifically looking towards outdoor schools, out towards swim lessons, therapeutic recreation, out of cost recovery into a new. GL, general ledger account that would not be accounted for cost recovery. It still will be revenue producing. It just won't be tied to the main cost recovery of the rec center and adult sports, e-sports, frankly, all will still live in that one. Um, then we have some other ideas within there that include getting credit for doing um, scholarships, credit, because that's not real money to us. Yet we provide the services um, and expanding the scholarship program on top of that because it has been for well forever mm -hmm. since we started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has been offering hundred dollars. Well, hundred dollars is the same as it was twenty five years ago. So expanding that. So it's all a package that we have put together that um, I'd love to give to you guys. <laughs> but that's kind of the gist of what we're going with that right now. And we have. Um, support from management for sure uh, to take a solid look at this or the financial impact. And that's kind of where they're going to be digging in over the next month behind the scenes of budget folks. And, and maybe it'll have to be phased in. But yeah. one of the things, especially with the outdoor pool, is a goal of trying to actually reduce what we charge to make it more affordable for. Uh, folks in our community to take more advantage of that yeah. and, and we really feel like our cost recovery does not allow us to be community friendly because it, it ends up excluding people and then that does allow us also on the flip side of that the, the part that stays within cost recovery for us to change those fees a little bit more flexibly to address those issues there and try to take care of those core things that are with the largest community impact and some lessons that Jeff and I and all of us in recreation consider to be the most important thing that we do. So if that, uh, if that makes sense. Any questions on that presentation? Does that, does that <laughs> go to, when does that go to council? Or what is We're, the process? Um, I, don't, I don't have a timeline. I have a, something in writing that I have uh, the finance folks have signed off on the idea of. So right now I'm giving them some, some numbers to play with. So what do these buckets look like? I'm giving some projections. And when they do that, then it will run it up through, um, through Harold and Jim and, and then, then get it out to council. Timeline in August that has to be a Harold and Jim. Yes. Yeah. Our thought is that sometime in September with the with the budget um, presentations that we share that with council at that time. Is that something we should put on our August agenda? It, it probably about? would be a good idea yeah. to do that. Yeah, I, I, want, I would like to be at the point of being able to give you guys something that we're actually presenting, and we should be. That should be. That was my intent and. You're going to give them information and then hopefully give them the actual proposal. That, you know, which is really, it's really, I think, dumb. But you know, those final things that are really the budgetary impact items. It's great to do. 
love the idea of rethinking the self-imposed constraints. <laughs> so, why wouldn't you say they're self-imposed? Somebody, somebody, right. Yeah. Like kind of arbitrary constraints. Yeah. Like, why, yeah, why do we do this? Oh, I don't know, because we always did. It was a number that was picked. It's right. Like, yeah, it's really good to think, to think, think quickly about it. And it's, it's uh, yeah, trying to, that world just doesn't quite work anymore. It's just a good thing. Uh, I have a question about sunset. I saw that the numbers are really good for sunset this year. I've been there a bunch. It's been booming. It's been great. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering about the the hours it's open till in the evening and how it's working out with the full facility rentals. If those have been popular and it out every night, yeah. or not? I just didn't set the numbers for that. Yeah, our our rentals. Um, yeah, we didn't include rentals on the evening. Yeah, in our little snapshots. Yeah, um, rentals are I think full okay. the summer. Okay, so it's. We've expanded that program, um, and it's pretty much been full for the summer. Right. Mm -hmm. And is that seen as a good trade-off revenue-wise versus keeping the pool open for two more hours? Yes. For passes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we don't we don't get a lot of folks for dropping that time of day, so doing parties and things like that add, definitely yeah. add in a, a revenue. And get more people in the pool, which is which is cool. And you still have morning laps for the other pool. Yeah, it's been booming. It was nice, uh, nice warm weather. It's good. Yeah, this weekend should be crazy. The parking lots, the parking lots reopened now too, so it's nice. Yeah. Other questions from packet? Okay. Uh, any items from staff? I would, I would like to just talk about. Uh, 4th of July event. I would like you to as well, yeah. Um, it uh, was pretty busy. I think the, the weather couldn't have been any better for yeah. We counted over 9,000 people at the gates and really were... Just for the festival? Yeah, pretty compacted for pretty tight space. Um, but overall, um, I think our first time was very successful. I think the the things that were what I will call somewhat negative were some some things that you just can't can't tell until you get there. We had eight food trucks. There were some people that were standing in line for two hours waiting to get food. Uh, the the line for for beer and and beverages was also um, uh, long at times. But uh, I would say the servers probably really earned their money that, that <laughs> it, it, it was the type of thing I was telling Paige before we started that at Wibby's, you were here with your beer like this and you couldn't move very much because you were going to spill it on someone else or on you. Um, you know, and there were, there were two, two types of, of groups, I would say, that went to the event. There was the entertainment group that wanted music and, and beverages. And then there was the other group of people that were staking out space to watch the drone show and, and the uh, fireworks. Well, that drone show was something yeah, else. Was pretty and nice. I will say it, it almost surpassed, I mean. It was amazing. It, I didn't want it surpassed my expectations and it surpassed, I think, uh, that, you know, fireworks are fireworks are fireworks, you know, but I'm saying that drone show is, if uh, it was just outstanding, yeah. yeah. If we could get that for a uh, uh, winter holiday or something yeah. like that, man, I don't we know actually why. talked about that today. Yeah. But uh, thank you to council and to the city manager for trusting us to do the event. Um, the, the staff was great, thank you to <coughs> David and the Rangers. Um, they did an outstanding job of keeping people out of the Dickens nature area. And uh, it just for a short time to organize things, it really all fell into place. And I think the community overall was pretty happy with it. And Jeff doing and other duties as assigned. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you think that have we have 12, 12, 12 uh, 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 food trucks and the, the problem with right there is where, where to put them. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, if we're putting them anywhere, we're displacing people. And they didn't have enough. It was very tight as it was. So it's. Great problem to have for the first time. Yeah. 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 How is how is it for the Rangers? 
You know, I actually got there around <coughs> two, and there were people down along the beach area. They had already, most people that were there doing had set up blankets or chairs in the grassy areas, and they had been telling people coming in, there were signs there, so everyone pretty much knew they had to be out by four o'clock. Um, they did a pass with the vehicles, and the, they talked to people first, and then with the, the bullhorn saying it's time to go, and people grumbled a little bit, but everyone left, and there was really no, no problem with that, so. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. You know, we did allow people to continue moving through so we could get people to Martin and Main Street stuff, but no one set up, no one stayed there. There was no loitering during the fireworks at all. So. Did, did they allow people to watch fireworks from the bridge? From Martin Street? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, people put their chairs up on Yeah, so when they left the beach area, they could go up yeah. onto Martin Street and they could watch yeah. fireworks up there, too. Yeah. And that was good more doing that on Main not. Street. So. Yeah, we I didn't do that. That's all I have. Cool. Yeah, uh, that was, was great. A good job, guys. Great. Do you yeah. feel like a template for future years? Okay. It's, it's a starting, starting point. Ways. I think yeah. we learned some mm -hmm. things and, um, you know, need to talk about the location. Is that the right place? If it is, how do we expand the footprint? Those kind of things. I should have comment. I went to the Roosevelt uh, Orchestra thing, which was great. A little involvement from the city, I think. It was all around the orchestra, but um, it only worked because it was the nicest day in two weeks, probably. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have been a heat stroke yeah. disaster. But it worked really well to be up there, and, and it was, helped where we were too for the same yeah. reason. Yeah. You had ten degrees to the asphalt. And yeah, it's just that's yeah. a lot hotter. I mean, it was, it was, it was perfect. Yeah, I think the only way you could possibly expand is if you were to close two eighty seven. And go across the way to. Like, Did you talk to Harold? Yeah, you talked to you. Talk to you. <laughs> no, he said Harold. That is with the proposals for those. Yeah. I'm just thinking yeah. it's uh, logical. <laughs> yeah. We've got ideas. Yeah. Lots of ideas. So yeah. bottom line is we did too good a job, and we'll we'll be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. I did really think it came together well, given the really yeah. difficult yeah. challenge. Sam Feldman's are. Coordinator for our events. She is as good as there was good communications too about where to go and things that were happening. Yeah, there was. It was quite good. Yeah. I have an idea from Grandjaw. Guys, living on the winter. Have just reindeer and sleigh that mm -hmm. could have like passes over mm -hmm. like Jenny Coors on that or something like that. And the the problem we're hearing is you cannot do it over can't do building people. Okay. Over buildings or people just yeah. Uh, so uh, it takes you to giant more and some other. Which almost yeah. takes yeah. any opportunity away from Longmont Lights to be open. Which was actually yeah. the reason yeah. they had the area closed too. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. So you can't yeah. do it over buildings. Okay. You can't even parts of it. Right. There's drones over my house all the time. And, 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 and then there's no room like, to view it because you got to be from the side. Yeah. Yeah. There's a yeah. giant decay. Like those things are east moving at 27 miles an hour, and if they just get in November, I spoke directly with the FAA about this, and I pointed out to them, I said, about drones, I said, with the lithium batteries and everything, people's just poor choice of things, especially after the Marshall Fire, uh, they were talking about deliveries and stuff like this, and I said, you know, we, how do we stop that? But more importantly, I, I said, like drones wanted to come up and t a show like uh, Button Rock Dam area and everything like that. And their response was, and you're gonna love this because it's really, a, it will warm your heart. We can action afterwards. <laughs> that was, that means that if they burn the forest down around Button Rock Dam, I said, just to clarify it, you can go and sue the people who did it afterwards, right? Yeah, because that makes such a difference. And they said, yeah. And I said, this just smacks of the fact that, you know, in 1981, they fired all these guys, and now you've got what you got. You've got people that just do not understand the ecological aspects of it. I don't really mind the drone that goes over my house. No, but I'm just saying. That it will happen probably more. Some kid it'll probably happen more and more summer, often. Right? Is what their oh, concern is, yeah. is because yeah. of the fact that the Amazon wants to do del drone delivery, yeah. and that's where they start talking about. I said, what about eighty mile an hour winds? Yeah. 
longer like we get action afterwards. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we use poor decisions. Any more study points about the time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got, we got five minutes if we can have yeah. this. So, uh, Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the one you saw last week. Yeah. But I have some new photos. Um, it's just kind of fun. I thought maybe we'll do like four weeks updates. <coughs> just kind of like this, this year in four weeks. But they're putting in the big under drain system now, <coughs> which is just huge. Just to move all that water from those failing fields. And it's pretty incredible. These were actually taken today. And then um, they also are reusing some stone that Timber had from his team. I can't recall where they were storing it. But we're going to be repurposing that over there um, to prevent cars from driving between the trees at the tree line onto the fields from the fencing line. So it's just a way to have kind of a natural barrier. And then, um, I would, if you guys have them, I would love some talking points about why it makes sense to put artificial turf there. Because I, I can put a lot, lot of stuff together yeah. all the time. Like, yeah. why are they replacing that and with grass? And it's actually been published in the Times Call now, and, and yeah. several, I think, so they got picked up in my other news sources, but I can never send out something. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Fox Meadows, Future Park, the sign is now behind the fence. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, it's interesting because we have Clover, Fox, Bright Creek, and now Thompson under construction. Um, and that makes it very visible. And so when you're visible, then it becomes very visible. <coughs> and whenever I walked in and you asked the question about Thompson and the timing, yeah. if you do or if you don't, there's going to be opinions on both sides of that. No, 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 no. And yeah. so, <laughs> yeah. so it's just tough. And so, you know, with these projects, getting them fenced in, starting the site logistics, getting all of the erosion control measures in and all of that, it's just, it's going to get the project done. So we're just staying the course. We're continuing forward. Um, so as exciting as it is, it's just fun to see future park fence. Um, <laughs> Spring Gulch, now they did, I just, I don't have the same slides. I just put, anyway. These are what you saw last week. So the delay right now, today they were out there. DeFalco um, has run into some challenges, and they are delayed as it noted in your state packet, or your, um, your packet. Um, but they have some sandstone walls down here that they put in where it's going around into the underpass, and they're gonna have to do some rework on some of this. So now we're another three years behind. So. From the packet or the packet is accurate? It might be from the packet. August. Uh, and then Thompson. Thompson, as you all know, now it has the west sidewalks closed. The, that's part of where they're going to be doing all of their mobilization, moving their equipment into the playground area. They will be putting a fence around the shelter area, and they're going to be starting these activities over the next four weeks um, for the demolition, the surveying, and the grading. So a lot of things are going to start disappearing in Thompson. And had you worked with Elisa on a, I know you had talked about something. I don't need to bring it up if you don't want to. It's okay. Okay. I did. She's been very helpful. Okay. I think those are all the updates we have. Oh, Nino is out to bid. So it's going to be, the bids are coming in on the 24th of July. Well, that we get bids. But I think it's, it's favorable. Garden Makers is getting ready. It has started design. Um, the first kickoff design meeting was today. Roosevelt Park, that SOQ is going out um, not in June. It's going out in July on whatever it's stated in the packet. I think it's the 12th or something. Um, and then Dog Park 1, that SOQ is, is in the works with procurement right now. And then Daniel and Sarah already gave their update. So. Okay, and are so we can... I do have one piece of me put it on after you bang the gavel. I learned something really cool today. I asked Taylor to put it up as you guys are walking on if you watch it. Um, they did a little video with the volunteer oh, program, mm-hmm. and I thought it was, oh, oh yes. Good. Actually, Stephanie, do you want to just log back in? I guess Teams it to you. Okay. That's great. You're going to try and do it with So, yeah, if you guys want to jab it out, let her do it. I thought it was, I saw it as like, Oh, something happens that I don't even know. It's a good feel good way to end the meeting. It's a good feel good way, yes. While she's doing that, can I just ask her a question? Um, And it sort of relates to our open space presentation, but I would love maybe at our next meeting to talk about what it would look like to revisit the Dry Creek master plan. Because I know, you know, we heard like this, all of these things that are being planned to implement there and kind of build it out like a another sandstone of sorts. 
but I think there's a lot of value in keeping retaining more of the natural area there. And I think we've heard some of that from the community when we were talking about the rec center. So I had three people contact me and had a sit down meeting that uh, wanted it more natural and why were we doing all this? And I said, this was always, this was not that open space. This was always a park. I said, maybe there's some sort of discussion that can go on with that one up further that uh, because so of the price, neighborhood yeah, park yeah, adjacent to it. I said, I, I said, that's not for me to call it something you'll have to have. I'd like to have a conversation. I can listen to. You don't have to log in to watch it. Oh, you don't? Yeah, if you just post it back. Okay, because I'm like, I don't know. I've just been trying to remind people that they do a great job of buying open space and then trying to put their neighborhood and community parks and those needs throughout the city. And I think Stephanie and her team is looking at design, taking those natural elements and really building it into that is something we do. But there's nothing that stops us from having. For the conversations, I mean, I the, the timeline. Is about like as master plan is engaged, right? Are, are we stuck with them if they're not relevant to what has happened in the community? I agree. I agree. But how, how is it not relevant though? We haven't added oh, uh, Jesus, athletic Jesus. complex for you. <laughs> no, I, I agree. That's uh, I think it's just uh, there's more of the sense that uh, some of the community. Uh, our side over here is if you all tell them to build, we'll build it. Oh, yes. Yes. I just like to have a conversation. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely fine. I just, again, we're not the decision maker. Well, role. in all fairness in our CIP, first off, we need to see what year it might be um, to plan ahead for that piece. And we don't know. So that's, you know, a larger part. So. But yes, I think we definitely have the conversation. Taylor, you want to send us out on nine? We're going to yeah. we do this journey. Feel good. Or do want to adjourn. So we got the yeah. okay. it's 53, 53 seconds. I move that we wait for 53 seconds to adjourn. <laughs> 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 also, oh, yeah, let's get different. All in favor, aye. Uh, aye. 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 Can it serve your community and the outdoors? Where's that? Sandstone. All the ground. No, I need a lot of people. This is where I live. These are the places that I use. But learning, I'm always learning new things, but I haven't gone to it. It's a way to get back. Oh my god, I just want to walk around and yeah, this is good. <laughs> Volunteering is something you're interested in doing. Feel free to sign up on our website at longmont.givepulse.com. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Taylor. I'm Midway Jen. Five seconds. Aye. Aye.